Good morning. Uh, thank you uh, so much for spending just a few minutes with me as we look at uh, John chapter 2. I'm Ben, if you don't know, and I'm uh, and I look after the churches in Kingston, Ashford Hill and Headley. Before we look at the passage, shall we pray together? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love for each one of us. We thank you that you are with us, whether we're sat in a church building this morning or whether we're at home. And we ask that, that, that your presence uh, by your spirit might lead us as we reflect on this passage from your word. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. England fans abroad, football fans, do not have the best reputation, do they? Uh, do you remember those scenes that we used to often see in the 90s of chairs being thrown outside bars, crowded streets, beer flowing, and it caused many fights across Europe. And, and imagine a similar scene, but this time not at, at Neukamp or Wembley, but in an older building. In fact, an incredibly impressive building. I wonder what the most impressive building is that you've been to. I think probably the most impressive for me was at St. Peter's, Rome. You know, it's a vast building. Huge cathedral, stone floor throughout, hushed, silence, vaulted ceilings. And imagine if a disturbance like that, uh, which the England fans have become known, to, known for, were to happen in such a building. Imagine the candle stands were knocked over, the tables were tipped and emptied of their contents, contents the displays were ripped down, and somebody drove the people out. Well, the Swiss Guard would be all over it, wouldn't they? Now, Jesus in this passage from John chapter 2 isn't quite inside a vast building, but he is very near one. He's in the outer court of the temple. Now, this is the court of the Gentiles, which surrounded uh, the inner courts and the most holy place. And he's there just before the Jewish Passover. And the Passover is a, a very important Jewish festival, which reminds the people, reminds the Israelites of God freeing them from slavery in Egypt. And so we see a crowded court, but crowded not just with people, but with animals as well, being prepared for sacrifice and tables with money on them uh, ready to be exchanged. Um, the special temple currency that was used. And Jesus comes in and he does something quite extraordinary. He drives out the animals and, and the sellers. He tips the tables and he does it all using a whip. Uh, Jesus' action here is stark, isn't it? It's unlike anything else we see. The disciples say it's, it's zeal. They say zeal for your house will consume me. Now, now zeal is something of an un-British quality perhaps, isn't it? Zeal means eagerness, ardent interest in the pursuit of something, fierceness of indignation, or perhaps even noble aspiration. But it's very un-British what we see Jesus doing. He's angered, he uses force, he clearly shouts. It's very unlike the meek and mild image we have, have, of, have of him. And it's very unlike our assumption of what Jesus is like. This is an impassioned action and he does it twice, once here at the beginning of John's Gospel and once at the end of his ministry at which Matthew, Mark and Luke recount. So why such a response? Well, as the disciples say, I think the first thing is it's because Jesus is zealous for his father's house. The disciples uh, in their reflections after the event remember uh, what Psalm 69 says, which is zeal for your house will consume me. Now, Jesus is zealous for his father's house because he sees what's going on in there. And, and there's two things that are going on in there. Firstly, I've entitled insider trading. You see, what's happening in the temple is there's a trading racket. There's a sale of, there's a sale, they're, trying, they're selling animals for the sacrifice, which is legitimate. And pilgrims would have come from across the Roman world and it would have been difficult for them always to bring a sacrifice. So animals did need to be sold near the temple. Um, you could bring your own animal, but here's the racket. The problem is, is, if you brought your own animal, it would have to be inspected by the priest. And if any blemish were found on it, it would be rejected. And of course, uh, it would be more easily rejected by them, particularly if they were profiting from the sale of the animals. And that was happening, you see. The temple authorities were profiteering. Uh, they got a captive market, they were able to charge what they liked and they were exercising an unfair abuse of power. 
And money changing, the, sh the same really. Pilgrims had come from afar, so may need to change their money. For some reason, the temple authorities would only accept Tyrium shekels. That is, uh, shekels uh, minted at Tyre, which had a special status in the Roman Empire, a city uh, near the Holy Land, but not in it. And, and ironically, this coin depicted a picture of a pagan god, a Baal, which Israel had had so much trouble with in the Old Testament. Jesus is furious at the corruption, the profiteering, and the abuse of power. But he's also, so there's insider trading, but he's also, he can also see that they are trading on God. You see, they're not just corrupt, which is terrible in and of itself, but they are trading in spiritual things. There's nothing worse, is there, than a preaching preacher promising favour with God if gifts are given to him. It reminds us of the pre the, before the Reformation, uh, when there were sales of indulgences, certificates, which told you that uh, you could get to heaven. Favour with God could never be bought or traded. God graciously gives opportunity to worship, and he sees the heart. And so Jesus is annoyed that his father's house has been turned into such a house of trade, house of merchandise, as the old version puts it. Perhaps you'd like to imagine an emporium or a market, or even that word can be translated as a port. Jesus is zealous for his father's house because there's stuff going on that's wrong, insider trading. And then also, Jesus is zealous for his father's house because he believes in inclusive worship. And, uh, and I'm going to talk about this under two headings. Firstly, breaching the peace. Now, you might say, well, Jesus is breaching the peace here, surely. Surely the temple police will come in and arrest him. Well, the thing is, Jesus does what he does because he's zealous for God's house. And what he finds is that the courts are full of animals, bleating, mooing, cooing, ready for the sacrifice, probably a little bit unsettled. And this is a real problem. There's noise, there's activity, there's, there's the hubbub of the market. And it's very difficult for people to worship in such settings. It's distracting. There's a loss of reverence and awe in the temple. But more than that, uh, secondly, they're breaching the blessing. You see, the Israelites, the people of Israel, uh, were meant to be a blessing to other nations. This market is being held in the court of Gentiles. And so where the Gentiles can pray, if you like, is being filled by all this stuff, which means they can't. Since Abraham's time, they had been called to be a blessing to all nations, but they end up here being a curse, push, pushing away those who didn't have Abraham in their physical, natural lineage, pushing them away. And Jesus is zealous for God's house, and he longs that all might be able to worship him. He longs that everyone might be invited to worship the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then finally, we see here that Jesus is indisputably family. Do you see how he says, my father's house? You know, it's like the son who returns to his parents' house to find it ransacked by his friends, and he orders them out and makes sure they take their junk with him. You know, Jesus was the only one who had the right to do such things, because actually the temple was his own house. There should have been red carpet put out for him. And yet they didn't expect him to arrive. Um, Malachi 3, 1 to 5, if you want to look at it again, uh, speaks of the arrival of the Messiah and the temple authorities not realising that it was going to happen. So we see that um, Jesus is zealous for his father's house. But secondly, in this passage, we see also that Jesus is zealous for us to meet his father. And we're going to look, on, look at this under three headings. Firstly, sanctuary destroyed. Now listen to what Jesus says. That he, he, he drives them out of the temple and then the Jews say, well, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? And Jesus says to them in verse 19, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Now, interestingly, there are two different words 
used for temple in this passage. In verse 14 and 15, there's a word called, word called hieron. It's the word that we get hierarchy from, and it comes, it means sort of holy. And, and it was a word that retur- referred to the whole temple complex. So the outer courts and the inner courts. But in verse 19, Jesus uses a different word, and that is of naos. And naos is more the central part of the temple, the sanctuary, if you like, um, the, the holy place. And, and so Jesus says, destroy this temple and I will raise it up. Again, it's significant that he uses a different word. Now, the Jews listening to him say, well, you know, this temple's been, been rebuilt for 46 years. Herod's been working on it. Uh, and there's, a, in fact, there'll be another 30 years uh, until it's completed. In fact, it's only just completed before it's ransacked in AD 70 by the Romans. Um, And so they can't understand how Jesus will destroy this temple and then rebuild it in three days. And yet what we see is that the disciples understand, and we're told in this passage, that Jesus is referring to his body. Because as we we look at Jesus in his ministry, as we read about it in the scriptures, we see that God dwells in him. We see it in the miracles and in his extraordinary teaching. We see actually that Jesus is the real temple and the temple that stands made out of made out of stone is actually not working. It's broken. In fact, Revelation 21 reminds us that God and the Lamb are the temple in the new kingdom. And so Jesus, referring to himself as the the most holy place, if you like, um, is saying that God dwells in me. He's saying it in a very veiled way, isn't he? Um, And he's saying that actually the temple will be destroyed. This temple will be destroyed. They would destroy this temple. Um, In John 5, we see Jesus referring to God as his father again, and the religious authorities going and plotting to kill him. And we see this temple destroyed, the holy place of life. His very own body we see destroyed as it is torn by thorns, punctured by nails, and pierced by a spear. You see, zeal for God's house would literally consume him at the cross. And so we see there a sanctuary destroyed, the dwelling place of God in Jesus' body destroyed. But we also see, and Jesus refers to this, I will raise it up again in three days, sanctuary raised. You see, Jesus was and is the Lord God. Not only does God dwell within him, But he is God and he raised himself up from the grave. Death could not hold him, as a modern song puts it. Uh, He is the living God. Uh, And as an older song puts it, up from the grave he arose with a mighty with with a mighty triumph over his foes. We see Jesus, though dying, the sanctuary destroyed, being then raised to life because he is, he was and he is God, the living God. Hebrews 7 tells us that he possesses an indestructible life. So the sanctuary is destroyed but the sanctuary is also raised so that we can meet with the Lord God and this is the final point. Sanctuary entered. You see, Jesus' desire in this passage is for people to meet with and come to know God. That's why he's so angry about the whole of the outer court being filled with junk. And his desire is the same now, for people to meet and come to know God. He invites us to know God in him, in Jesus, to trust that as we see Jesus in the pages of the Bible, that he is the son of God, God himself in human flesh. As we read these words, he invites us to trust that they are true, that Jesus is real, that he is the son of God. He invites us to believe. But the invitation is not just to believe. Let me remind you of the verse later on in John's gospel, the sort of purpose statement of John's gospel. And it says this, it's chapter 20 and verse 31. 
these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. You see, believing in your head, that's not enough. We're also called to have life in Jesus' name. And that's about growing in our trust of Jesus and trusting him no matter how hard, and it has been a very hard last year or so, trusting him no matter what. And in trusting ourselves to him, growing in our trust of him, trusting him with our very lives. How do we live trusting Jesus? Let's seek to do that day by day, put our trust in him, knowing that he is able to deal with everything that life throws at us. And finally, let's heed that final warning. You see in verses 23 to 25, we see many people who are so impressed by the miracles of Jesus. They believe that he is, you know, a miracle worker. Perhaps they believe that he is the Messiah. And yet Jesus sees that though they believe, they do not trust him. They may believe that he's the Messiah, but they do not yet have life in his name. Let's not just be convinced and believed in our heads, but let's trust him with our hearts. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we do uh, thank you for this passage. We thank you for the passion of Jesus, uh, that he longs that people would meet with him and come to know the living God. And I pray for people listening uh, to this message, that they might, uh, if they don't already, uh, come to know the Lord Jesus and to put their trust in him. Please, Lord, may they see that he longs to welcome them in to his kingdom, that he longs to welcome them and to know them and to love them. And we pray that as he knocks on the door of their hearts, that they may open it up, that they may put their trust in him. And for the rest of us, Lord, who, who perhaps already know you, who are already perhaps fitfully trusting you, please increase our faith. Help us to trust you. Lord, we long that we might not just believe in the Son of God, but that we might have life in his name as well. Meet with us this week, your people, as we, as we seek you, as we pray, as we read, as we worship. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name and for his glory.